Welcome to the Tough Decisions Network for Entrepreneurs. I'm Dan Hanford, and my wife, Danae, and I interview successful people sharing stories behind tough decisions that they've had to make along their journey as an entrepreneur. Before we get started, let's hear from one of our sponsors. Want daily interviews with real estate investors and none of the fluff? Go to bestevershow.com where Joe Fairless interviews real estate investors and entrepreneurs daily about their best advice ever. Go to bestevershow.com. With us today on the podcast is Lane Kawaoka. He is all the way from Honolulu, Hawaii, and he's a current full-time civil engineer and real estate investor. And he currently has 11 single-family homes in his portfolio with experience in the United States in Seattle, Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and Pennsylvania. He is also the co-owner of MF. PE Investments that currently controls over 1,300 multifamily apartment and RV units. Thank you so much, Lane, for being with us today. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi, Lane. We always like to get started with just a little bit of background and allow our guests to kind of fill in some of the gaps for us. So talk to us a little bit about you know your work and how you got into real estate investing and why that was a good choice for you as far as your investment. Yes, I got started probably about 10 years ago, I followed that linear path to go to school, get a good job, went to school for civil engineering, industrial engineering, went to work as a construction supervisor and um, just saved up to buy a first primary residence because that's what everybody says that you're supposed to do. But because I was never home working all the time and traveling all the time for work, I decided to rent that out. And at the time that was $2,200 a month and the mortgage was $1,600 a month. So for like a young 22, 23 year old at the time, that was a lot of beer money. And I was like, wow, I gotta do this again and again and again. And um, you know, I did all the mistakes and that was like a class A rental. You know, The rent to value ratio wasn't as strong as, as I later found out I could get. But um, yeah, I fell into it and I was like, wow, I gotta do this again and again and again, because this was the way out of the rat race. So what are some of the tough decisions, you know, as we dive in deep here that you have to make as a working professional and also doing real estate at the same time? So as I progressed along, I began with a private company and, you know, that was traveling 100% of the time, living in hotels, probably about that 40, 80 hour work week kind of a deal going on. But as I got more and more rentals, probably about five to eight of them, I kind of passed through this threshold where, you know, I kind of became unemployable and I kind of stopped caring in a sense because I was like, well, why, why am I going to work, you know, 50% harder for like 10% more pay? I mean, I'm just going to go get a couple of rental properties at 600 bucks a month on a cash flow, you know, or that $8,000 a year or whatever it, you know, pay increase. And from there, I kind of made the conscious decision to get off of that, you know, that fast track, you know, that going for that manager role. And I actually went for more, uh, you know, government jobs. I kind of got out of that, that fast paced, very cutthroat environment. And how do you, you know, really kind of balance both the professional life as well as building and continue to build this portfolio that you're creating? I mean, don't get me wrong, right? Like you got to do the day job. You got to get the job done. You got to get done with a high quality. But, you know, for a lot of jobs, like it doesn't take the full eight hours a day. And it, what it definitely doesn't need to do is to drain all your energy. And I think for the last five years, I mean, it's a lot of time coming home. You know, even if you, if you have a community and you, know, you come home, you have a choice. You're either going to turn on the Netflix, veg out on the couch, or you're going to get it back on the computer and look for deals and, you know, get your spreadsheets open and, and get to work. I mean, it's not a hard decision, but it's a tough one to make consistently every day. And, you know, I mean, I, I spent at least two, three hours every single day working on the real estate stuff after, after the full day's work. How many hours? How about two, three? That's but granted, not, you know, I'm that's doing not a ton. Yeah. 
and then you're still doing some really big things, even though you're only spending a few hours a day, you know, working on that. But, you know, I think anybody who has a day job right now that tries to start a business outside of their day job or even trying to get into real estate, you know, you've got to have some sort of, you know, passion behind that as well to continue to keep on moving forward with it. Right, right. I mean, there's, there's got to be a proof of concept, right? Like, I mean, I know already that this is going to get me out of the rat race. I mean, I'm almost there. It's just, just got to keep, keep putting the pedal to the metal and just keep picking up rentals. And you know, just the, the day job helps, I think really helps you in many aspects that a lot of people don't think of. I mean, I think of, people think of leaving the day job and they're like, woohoo, entrepreneurship, right? But I think that keeping the day job keeps you very lean as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You, know, you don't have all 12 hours to go waste on you know, things that don't make sense. You're limited to the amount of resources you have. And it also makes you very patient as a real estate investor. You don't like go after crazy deals because you are, you're not in desperation mode because you have food on the table. The day job pays for that. So what are some of the, you know, I know you like, you know, talking about how starting in single family is probably a good way to kind of enter into the real estate piece. And then you're also in a lot of multifamily spaces as well. And you've been on both sides, both GP and LP side, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So I started with the single family home, got a couple of them where I was there, um, you know, in Seattle at the time, but then I, you know, 2012 came along and things just weren't cash flowing where I was at go figure. <laughs> you can't cash flow in a private market today. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to Birmingham and that was kind of a big, big pivot point for me and, you know, getting one of these turnkey remote rentals and it worked. So I traded the two Seattle rentals for nine properties out of the state. So I became that remote single family home investor at that point. Mm-hmm. But then I get to a point where, you know, you just do the math, right? Like it's a lot of work to get a single family at home. You know, it takes, takes a couple months of, you know, work, sending stuff to the lenders and it's kind of a pain. And, you know, for what, $300 a month of cash flow? I mean, you, you quickly realize that you're going to need almost 30 of these things to get anywhere, um, you know, $10,000 passive a month. And with the 10 rentals, 10, 11 rentals, I was getting about an eviction or two a year. And probably about four big catastrophes that happen. And, you know, like I said, you need 30 of these things. So you multiply that by three. So you're having an eviction almost every month and or an eviction, like, you know, quite frequently. And then a big catastrophe that's happening every month. And I was like, whoa, that's just this is just not scalable. I've got to change my direction here. Hmm. And, you know, have you been on some not so good deals, either on, on the LP side or GP side of a deal where, you know, you maybe had to make some tough decisions in those deals as well? Yeah, my first deal, man, that was a big catastrophe. I mean, lesson learned here is don't work, work with people you don't know, like, or trust. I just got a recommendation off of, from an IRA, self-directed IRA custodian. And, they, and I said, I was... I was super green. I was like, well, what do people use this stuff for? And they gave me a referral, went over there, bought a house. The deal was that I buy a house and I get a 9% return back and then 50-50 at the split. Turns out the guy was kind of a shyster. And I, I learned that a little later on, you know, people I started meeting kind of said, yeah, you don't want to work with that guy. You know, so sure her enough, a few years later, get this letter in the mail saying that the portfolio has gone under and you know, when we kind of start digging, I found some of the other investors through the, you know, internet forms and, you know, what they were doing, they were kind of doing some digging and they found like a lot of the taxes weren't being paid strategically, you know, years before. So, you know, it was kind of a screw job from the get go, exactly what I was worried about most, but yeah, I mean, just got to do your due diligence on people and understand the investment and don't invest in the first thing that you see. I mean, get a look, see see some deals come your way as a as a LP partner. And I think you touched on something that's very important. Is you know a lot of times the property itself can look really good and the deal can look really good, but unless you really can trust the people who are on the GP side, that general partnership side, who are you know putting the plan into place, and, and unless you can trust them to execute the way it's designed, then it's gonna some it can sometimes bite you in the back. That's correct. Exactly. 
So talk to us about a tough decision that you made along this journey that had a really positive outcome or an outcome that was more, was kind of better than what you'd expected. Yeah, so I got to this point where I had, you know, 11 single family homes, you know, was cash flowing $3,000 a month. You no, know, it's cool, but definitely not enough to uh, quit my day job or kind of be financially free. So I kind of started to look into this multifamily thing. And when you first look at it, it's so confusing. Like the, it's, it's not like 30 year fixed debt with this, the Fannie Mae loans. You get all these like loan terms, you know, seven year, five year, 12 year terms. You got recourse debt, non-recourse debt. It's kind of confusing when you're first going in it. And at first I didn't really, I didn't really, you know, I looked into multifamily that I, but then I had that mindset where I was like, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. It's working. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people, I started to join different mastermind groups and mentorship groups. And I just saw people around me that were kind of like me, you know, they were also like engineers and you know, doctors, lawyers, but they were like 40 years old and you know, a little older than I was. And I was like, you know, I need to just kind of put my ego aside and just kind of follow and copy other people that are kind of in my shoes, but have progressed farther than me. So I kind of committed to doing multifamily and it took me about 18 months, but I finally got into my first deals and felt comfortable to analyze the deal and get, and I built my network up to a point where I could, you know, vet the people. And, you know, so your biggest tough decision there was, is was transitioning from single family and these one-off flips or whatever, if you will, or rentals into doing larger, either syndications where you're bringing on multiple investors on one deal or, you know, just going out and trying to, you know, be on the LP side of some of these, these different properties. Right. It's just like the, you know, my comfort zone, right? I was, I was in my comfort zone to just keep buying these single family homes. I knew how it worked, but something in my head, like I said, if you did the math, this just wasn't scalable. I'd make myself go crazy if I had 30 houses. So I kind of eased into it, you know, and try and break down the steps. You know, first step is go in a deal as a limited partner first, right? get to see how it is from the inside, get the monthly statements, see if my analysis on the front made sense, right? I mean, yeah, you go into these deals with 50 grand down, but that's not all the money you've got, right? And yeah, that's a lot of money to sort of experiment. But I mean, for me, it was like, you know, I, I knew where I was going and, and what I was doing wasn't going to be working. Well, and I think you also mitigate you know, as you move forward, some of your risks when you have a larger complex or a larger property, that would be a lot harder to fail than you would if you had a single family of residence or whatever that might not do so well. Yeah. I mean, the big deals, it's a lot less. It is mitigated over many units. Um, I think multifamily is, you know, by far more stable than a single family home, less cap X. But then again, you know, also on the flip side, it's like, you know, if if you're in a bad area, if the neighborhood turns on you, you know, all your units are in that bad area. <laughs> so but with a, with a, multi, with a large multifamily, right. you know, that area is your complex for a lot of times though. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I mean, if, even if you've got 150 unit, I mean, you can't really change the complexity of the block. Yeah, that's true. Right. But then, you know, this is, this is kind of where, you know, I realized as an investor, as an operator, I was like, well, I don't really think I'm that good. And I think some, most people, re, you know, it's Pareto's rule, right? Only 20% of the investors really know what they're doing out there. I mean, even though you own some single family homes, you're probably in the 80% that aren't very good at it. And I kind of saw myself as an investor saying like, well, you know, I, whatever I am, you know, I kind of think I'm not that great. So I'm just going to go and jump in with people who are the experts. At the same time, if, if you don't feel like you're the great person, then why do you think your investors are going to think that same thing? And why would your investors want to invest in you? So go get that experience and go learn from these, these people who are do, who have been doing it a while and are doing it better than you right now. And maybe down the road, you can gain that experience to be able to be one of those greats. Right, right. Lane, I'm kind of curious, how long have you been in the multifamily space? And do you now have both multifamily and single family? Or have you basically completely shifted over to the multifamily? Yeah, so I'm right in the middle right now. You know, I had that those 11 single family homes. I I think I've sold about three or four of them off. So initially I had 
I had a bunch of money. I sold my primary residence and I used that to initially go into the first bunch of deals. Eventually that that goes away, right? Because I allocate all my money. So the whole plan was to get proof of concept first, get into a few deals, get in, get get the deal stabilized, and then get you know get that proof of concept, just like how I did with the turnkey rental in Birmingham. You know, see how that is, and then start to transition. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm selling off my single family homes, one by one, and to go into a syndication, which which works very well because you know I get the best price for my single family home, and I I don't have a lot of liquidity. I minimize my liquidity. And, um, you know, sitting in the bank, not making any money. And they can kind of transfer slowly into a syndication deal, which quite frankly comes up very erratically. You know, it's just kind of like, hey, we got a deal. And then we, you got another one, but you may not have one for months. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, even some of the better, you know, the, the, the good syndicators that are larger syndicators that are out there, you know, right now, this market is very tough and trying to find these really, really solid good deals. And so, you know, right now you might only get four to maybe six tops of really good deals that come your way from some of these larger syndicators a year. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, some of these guys, it's, you kind of, you kind of scratch your head. It's like, well, how the heck are they getting so many deals? Uh, I certainly don't hope that they're not the one that keep winning at the bidding table. Cause that's, <laughs> well, but, and I think, you know, the biggest thing with most of these deals is capital preservation. So for me, you know, when you look at some of these deals, yes, I want to cash flow off of it. And yes, I want to make money off of it. But at the end of the day, if I risk putting in this 50,000, hundred thousand, you know, $500,000 into one of these larger syndication deals, at the end of the day, if the deal goes awry or doesn't go as planned, will I still be able to save or, you know, preserve my capital? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of investors think like that, but the ones that actually know how to underwrite the deals themselves, they know exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for a certain number. You know, they don't fall prey to all like the cap rate tricks and, you know, the these crazy occupancy numbers or expense increases, rent increases that these, the levers that are pulled to get the number, they know what's right. And I would say that's kind of a rare breed out there of accredited investors. I would say only 20% know actually how to do that. So I think you're right. The vast majority, 80% are kind of just going off of, uh, you know, I hope I don't lose my money. Well, I'm not talking about the GP side when I was mentioning that. I'm talking about more from the LP side. From oh, yeah. A, no, that's, from, I, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, because from an investor side where I'm not, you know, from the LP side, when you're not actually doing the underwriting, you're obviously going to look at the underwriting, but, you know, a lot of these LPs don't even know how to look at underwriting the right way. They look at the spreadsheet and go, oh, it looks, looks good to me. It looks like the IRR is, you know, 16 to 18% or more, you know, it looks like my equity multiple is going to be X, you know, maybe like two, two more, two, two plus, you know. And so they, they look at those high level numbers, but they don't really know how to break down the underwriting, which can sometimes be, be scary when, you know, you have all these investors j- jumping on and not really know what they're getting into. But what I was just trying to make a point of is, is even though as an investor on the LP side, as long as you see that there is some, some, some capital preservation in there, I think that's the number one thing for some of these LPs that, you know, definitely they're looking for those specific numbers of IRR and equity multiples and, you know, things like that. But they want to make sure at the end of the day, if the deal does go awry, can I still preserve my capital if we have to exit? Right. And, and to your point, it's kind of like, you know, you go to any good website out there like Airbnb, you know, most of us just see the front end. You know, hey, I think they should put this button here, this button there, the kind of the comments that we'd make. But if you're a developer, I mean, you know, the code behind that. So it's just two different worlds going on. And what I was going to say there, too, is the multifamily space, the apartment space is a very, you know, low, I wouldn't say very low, but it has a very high rate of being able to preserve capital versus maybe putting it into this, the stock market or something else that's a lot more volatile where you have a change in the market. You might lose all of your capital that you, you had put in to begin with in a stock. You might lose all of that. You know, We saw that back in 08. But when you have it in a property like this, and this, let's say you have a market correction, you're not going to lose all your capital. You know, you might not get the returns that you're looking for and you might, you might, depending on how the deal is, is lose a little bit of capital. But, you know, I've never heard of, at least in my circles, if anybody having a multifamily deal goes so bad that you lost all of your capital. 
Right. I mean, it, it's all determined by your business plan. I mean, if you go into a deal that's stabilized, 90% occupied or above, that's cash flow today. I mean, that cash flow is sort of your hedge. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're going to make your 80 to 100% performer return at the end of, you know, say five years with the cash flow. But if there's, like you said, there's a market correction, the time just takes longer, but you still get the cash flow. So it's kind of like hedging, you know, you got to have your money in the game, you know, and that cash flow is sort of what, you know, is the hedge so that you don't fall off the map, I think. Lane, talk to us just a little bit or to our audience about a resource or a book that you would recommend to someone, maybe starting some investments, maybe something that helped you in making the decision to get into this space. So a book or a resource that they could use. I would recommend The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, Gary Keller. But, you know, honestly, I'm not a very fan of reading books. I mean, I, I always tell people, go out and make a spreadsheet and go analyze 100 properties. I think that would do much better because the markets change, you know, when I was starting out buying turnkey rentals at 1.2% rental value ratio was the thing. Now you can barely find stuff that's even 1%. So, you know, at the end of the day, you want to know what's the deal. And a lot of it has to do with the numbers and, it, and that changes due to market conditions. So shifting gears here a little bit, Lane, obviously as a, as a you know, working professional now and also doing some of this real estate on the side, you've made some money up to this point. And I want to know what's the most exciting thing you've done with the money that you've made up to this point in your life, whether it's been traveling or purchasing something or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, you know, I, I went into this one deal and it was kind of like a guaranteed rate of return deal. I mean, it was a smaller interest. I think it was like 12% back. So I put like, seven seventy grand in there or like six hundred sixty grand in there just so I could get six hundred dollars back every month. And I did that specifically so I can go get a lease on my Mercedes because I always wanted one of those things. Mm-hmm. And you know, time value of money, I think all real estate investors, if you're actively investing, I think it's better to lease your vehicle. It's been kind of a fun thing. <laughs> Which then, Mercedes did you get? I got the C class for the common folk. You know, nothing crazy. <laughs> That's funny. You know, then I, um, you know, I, last year I moved from Seattle where I was up there after college for 14 years and I finally moved back home to Hawaii. Finally got over the the fact that, you know, Hawaii is 10% more expensive than San Francisco and places like that. And then, you know, I took like a 30% pay cut at work. But, but hey, you get to live, eat, did, right? did you get to live where you, you grew up? Right, right. Live where you want. Invest where the numbers make sense, right? That's say. right. That's awesome. And what's the number one thing or item on your bucket list right now? I think right now, you know, real estate wise, it's kind of the big thing for me. I'm just trying to take, make the biggest push I can right now. So that's selling all my single family homes that I think that I bought retail and trying to get out of that, get the equity out of there and put it into long-term stabilized syndications, that cash flow, you know, regardless of a, a market correction. And kind of create myself a little, you know, like how people create a CD ladder, but a syndication ladder where, you know, they all kind of cash out at different points in their cycles. So and are you trying to move most of that into the LP side or are you trying to do some GP stuff as well? I do GP stuff, but, you know, when, when I invest my money, it's always on the limited partner side. Uh, that's how, that's how um, general partners invest. Sure. They invest alongside. Sure. It, the money's treated the same way. It's, there's no special preferential treatment. No, no, but what I was saying is, are you doing uh, more on LP side on other deals outside of your own deals that you, where you might be the GP on, or are you kind of doing both? No, I mean, these days, like if I'm just going to do the GP, I mean, if I believe in the deal, I'm going to put my own money in it, and then mm-hmm. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna work the deal too. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, Lane, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us here all the way from Honolulu, Hawaii. I know it's really early in the morning for you right now. How can the listeners reach out to you and get some more information from you if they want to start to follow you a little bit more? Yeah, they can go to um, simplepassivecashflow.com. Also got a uh, podcast of up to episode 120 something now. So I've been doing it a couple of years now. And um, you know, if people want to get a hold of me, shoot me an email at lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. Check out the website. I got a lot of spreadsheets and all kinds of resources there for free. Well, Lane, thank you again so much for being on with us. I hope you have a good rest of your day, okay? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Tough Decisions Network. Be sure to visit toughdecisions.net 
to gain access to show notes for this episode and to join our free weekly entrepreneur email where we will send you news about the latest technology for your business, inspiring quotes, and the latest books for entrepreneurs. That's toughdecisions.net.